Hey guys, welcome. Welcome back to Interstage Window, my Saturday stream, which is always a conversation with some of my friends, communities, things like that. And today we have with us Landon. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. <laughs> hey, welcome in and welcome in, Kendra. So happy to see you <laughs> here. Um, welcome in everybody else that is here. I do see a few view viewers. So if you'd like to say so in the chat, then uh, oh, one of them is actually Landon. <laughs> in the chat all right guys um so as you can see it is a it is a harry potter themed stream today oh thank you so much for the applause kendra thank you so much um but uh landon tell everybody like what we're actually talking about today my favorite thing <laughs> my my truly truly favorite thing and that's wizard nazis uh which i know <laughs> sounds terrible to say that it's my favorite thing mm. but man 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 do i love a good fucked up villain <laughs> yes oh uh, yes a fucked up villain a fucked up side character villain mm. uh do i do i just love it yes in fact i do <laughs> mm -hmm. oh my gosh we both love it we both love it so much <laughs> I mean, this, is, this is how we became friends mm -hmm. um so it will this is just gonna be us fangirling for the next little while Yes. So if you also enjoy Wizard KKK, stay tuned because <laughs> we're going to talk all about it and um, the Daddy Issues Club. Exactly, Kendra. You get it. Um, yeah, but Daddy Issues. as we like to say for our Harry Potter streams, um, I want to make it clear that first, this is, of course, not spoiler free. None of our streams are spoiler free. Harry Potter's been out for forever. So um, even though we're only up to the fourth book in kind of where we're talking, of course, we're going to talk about things in the later books, too. This is not, you know, this is spoilers for the entire Wizarding World. Nothing is off the table. That's how we do. Um, second part of what we always want to say at the beginning of our Harry Potter streams is we do not support all of JK Rowling's obnoxious turfy Twitter shit. So <laughs> uh, please someone take her Twitter away. We, <laughs> Make we, her acknowledge, stop. we acknowledge that she wrote it because we, in, in order to acknowledge that she wrote it, we have to acknowledge the problematic things within it. Uh, but she can also go choke on a cactus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Choke on yep. a cactus. Mm -hmm. Choke on a cactus, JKR. Uh, and that's all I have to say about her. Um. <laughs> yep. So if you are interested um, in supporting us, you can do that today. But what we would prefer is actually if you spend that money on um, something like the Trevor Project, which goes to helping out LGBTQ youth, because we need to do some counteracting work to, um, you know, JK Rowling and her ilks turfery uh so if you're interested in supporting us today that's really what we would prefer it's up to you of course but um that's that's our thing so yeah. this is not a this is not a jkr friendly zone we're probably going to end up complaining a lot about her in this too it's kind of impossible not to every time we talk about harry potter <laughs> like if she could write a good villain <laughs> that, mm. would be, that would be nice mm. but we're gonna get into that yes <laughs> Okay, so here we go. Death Eaters, guys. Death Eaters. Oh, welcome in, Luna. Welcome scrub. in, Pickles. Oh my gosh. Luna, I can't believe you paused Taylor Swift for us. You must really love me. <laughs> That's crazy. Yes. Also, Scrub is here. Welcome. Doing homework. Oh, good luck on your homework. Good luck on your homework, Scrub. Do, do well. You know, only pay a little bit of attention. Let's mostly pay attention to your homework. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to us bitch about half evil villains. Mm-hmm. Yep, and um, Queen is especially positioned for baby cam today. If anybody wants that, happy to turn it on. Just do the redeem. And I saw, Lunar, that you um, added some more to the Finishing Doki Doki Literature Club, Literature Club. So thank you so much for that. If you guys would like to see me put the final act of Doki Doki on the schedule, then uh, please contribute to that. Welcome in, Jane. Welcome in. All oh, my faves. gosh, you guys. All of our friends are here. <laughs> favorite i want to just plug all of you right now it's true it's true okay landon um how do we want to how do we want to start this do we kind of want to start with just a little bit of a, a primer a primer on the the karen and landon lore does that sound okay sure that sounds good to me okay all right guys so the karen and landon lore um we've talked about some of this kind of piecemeal here and there on stream but here's here's the story the our origin story how we met so um we were in a Once Upon a Time roleplay together. Shout outs to Once Upon a Time fandom. You know, OGs remember the first few seasons, amazing, excellent TV, and then things happened, you know, <laughs> as they do. 
in most of the shows we like. We love these soap opera-y type of shows, um, which means like usually the first one to three seasons are good, and then they just go. <laughs> yes, unfortunately, yep. they do and continue mm. to, and mm-hmm. it's fine. I will mm-hmm. never get a satisfying ending for anything that I love, and it's I'm true. Sad about it. Yeah, but it's fine, and we'll move on. <laughs> yep. So we met in a once upon a time role play. We didn't really RP together like too terribly intensely in that role play. Um, I mean, our characters interacted, of course, but we weren't like you know we didn't have like planned out plots or anything like that. Um, and then uh, a little a little bit later, at several months later, uh, a friend of ours that was in the once upon a time role play started a Harry Potter Marauders era role play. And I learned that Landon also absolutely loved Marauder's era of Harry Potter. <laughs> so, it's so fascinating to me that it took months to learn this because mm-hmm. it is my personality. It is just <laughs> the entirety of my personality. I mean, um, I knew we were both Harry Potter fans, but I didn't know that you also had affection for the Marauders specifically. Love them. Yeah. Love them so much. So we did. So we joined that role play and eventually the Once Upon a Time role play closed and during the course of the Harry Potter role play, the original girl that created it had left. Um, this happens on Tumblr all the time. People get interested in other things. They they bail. They, you know, whatever. It shit happens, right? It was Tumblr. It's the internet. You know, people disappear. Um, and I had access to what you would call, like, the main, which basically means, like, the mod account in Tumblr, you know, RP language. And so um, I took it over with uh, Landon and also a mutual friend of our shadow, helping me. And what ended up happening from that really is because this was all kind of happening at the same time, um, is Landon had wanted to play uh, this character called, tell everybody the character that she wanted to play. So I wanted to play, I was, uh, so during this time too, the other important thing is this is a soap opera uh, show that I had really gotten into was Vampire Diaries. Mm-hmm. Um, and, obviously- <laughs> and you got me into it too. I started watching it as well around the same time. Well, because of this, I do mm-hmm. believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really wanted to pe- play a bad guy, um, but I wanted to do the Karen thing where you take an NPC or a character who who you don't have much background with and project something else onto them. Mm-hmm. So I really wanted to play Klaus Michelson from the Vampire Diaries because he was the big bad villain at that point and a really complex character and also a sad boy. And, you know, my brand is sad, so I needed to include that. Um, and I was like, oh, well, there is this character that is vague named Rebastian, uh, who I call Rabastan to this day, uh, <laughs> Lestrange, um, who is the, you know, step, who is the brother-in-law of Bellatrix Lestrange and the younger brother of the, of the Lestrange family. And, I could take this character and just just make him mine uh, and make him do evil little things. Mm-hmm. And I was like, but who, <gasps> back in the day, everything was about love, but who, whoever, could I have him fall in love with to be the monster that he truly is with? And that's where I was like, hey, Karen. <laughs> she like slid into my DMs, like literally. <laughs> Like, Only it was on Neat Chat, so it was like a, a PM on Neat Chat. Like that's how we was, did things in those days. I was just like, "Do you have you ever heard of Vampire Diaries? <laughs> Let me spam you with these ship videos so that you can see what I'm talking about." Because I'm really thinking you could write that we could write the really cool epic romance, and then we did. <gasps> oh my gosh, years. we did. <laughs> so so our our ship was basically Clara, Claroline Face Claim. So it yep. was Joseph Morgan and Candace Acola. And at the time, I was familiar with Vampire Diaries in the sense like I'd seen a little bit of it. And, um, and my husband had watched it. And so I had seen like most of the first season. And basically what I knew about Vampire Diaries is that um, Nina Dobrev, who plays Elena slash Catherine, was amazing. And otherwise, it was a vampire soap opera. And that was kind of like my opinion of the show. I hadn't I hadn't really like gotten super into it. But then we started playing these characters. I got super into it, of course. I hella hardcore ship Claroline. Um, I really I really love um, uh, Caroline as a character. I think she's great. And I just saw her and I said, I'm gonna make the girliest girl Death Eater I can possibly make. And I made like literally like the the makeup. 
um, you know, a beautiful trad wife um, character with a Candace Sicola face claim. That's what we did. And that is, and from that ship is how we really became friends as opposed to just like people that, you know, were role playing together. Yes. And I made the serial killer who was obsessed with her. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're going to talk about them more, but, yeah. um, but what we want to get into first is some of the more, you know, well-known Death Eaters, because yes. for you, you guys are probably like, I don't even remember Rebastian. That's like, because he's barely in there. It's literally just like, Rodolphus has a brother named Rebastian, and he's mentioned like once, and he's in like yeah. one battle, and that's he's, it. I don't even think he's in a battle. He, or at least he's not mentioned in a battle. He was arrested with Barty Crouch Jr. That's the, in the fourth, in the book that we just read, the fourth book. Mm, that's it's true. literally the only canon mention of him uh being being relevant at all so gotta mm -hmm. love that mm -hmm. okay. yep yep um, so we've got a bunch of death eaters that we want to talk about today um just like we did for our marauders episode so let's kind of go through each one and, and we'll talk about them well so, i thought i i thought a good place to start would be before we actually broke it down is also talking about like the evil the things that made the death eaters evil like mm. why, who they are, why they are evil, especially because so much of it is hinted at and never actually mm -hmm. shown to us yeah. throughout the series. Yeah. Um, yep. So I think that it's important to state that Death Eaters are basically the magical KKK, <laughs> um, where they, <laughs> wizard KKK, where they want to kill and destroy all muggles and anyone with muggle-born heritage, including... Yeah including half-bloods yeah i mean they're quite literally wizard um wizard magical nationalists i guess you could say plus fascists so they're, they're quite literally like nazis kkk you know pick your favorite ethno nationalist um you know slash fascist uh group there are many throughout history they are the wizarding world's version of that very explicitly yes and um we are told incredibly terrible things about these people that mm. they are villains that they're evil uh they wear dark robes and skeleton masks to hide themselves uh and they go forth and spread death uh, <laughs> you death. know death awful propaganda like all the bad things they do they do all the bad things um but and it, it is this yeah interesting concept that they're still hidden like it is still this unlike the nazis uh who wore themselves proudly without being hidden they're very similar to the kkk where they're wearing a mask and they're yeah. hidden amongst society so anybody could be a death eater uh which raised a lot of like panic in the first wizarding world war and then also gave an excuse for them to use as to why there are so many still out there because they were never caught mm -hmm. um because you can never really truly prove who was a death eater and who wasn't yeah and that's why i like to call them wizard kkk because there's a lot of silliness that goes on in a lot of these movements in real life like how the kkk called themselves or i guess call because they are still around oh my god true but they are um, they call themselves like wizards and stuff and they wear like these really silly hats and you know and I mean we we see this in a lot of these types of factions like you know if, if you've ever researched the Proud Boys you've probably seen the meme about how they have to take punches while naming cereals like it's just it's just silly and um, and so the Death Eaters are quite silly as well so very clearly inspired from um, from that type of of thing and you know and the nazis were quite silly too like they would like literally march in swastikas like that's not just a scene from the producers they really did that, <laughs> did that. um and so that's that's why the death eaters are um are not only very scary but uh but they do some really silly things too you know like uh, bellatrix's kind of sing-song talking that she does <laughs> yes, we're, gonna, we're gonna dive into them uh Jesus. yeah but um but no, when we but first when we first really meet them yeah, they are. They're cartoons, and we. But we first really meet them in the final scene of the. Um, well, the next to final scene of well, the fourth book that we just read. That's well, really like the first actually, time we encounter a lot of them. I think it's actually important to set up the first time we meet them, which is in the first part of the book, of mm -hmm. the fourth book, that there is chaos happening at a wizarding event, the Wizard World Cup, where a group of people who are attending this event and camping in these sites uh, harassed and torture and assault 
a family of muggles. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. and just having some chaos. drunken fun. <laughs> yeah, having some drunken, some drunken fun and torture. Uh, and it's a really <clears throat> scary setup because it feels like it feels very real. It's a very tense moment in the series. All of the wizards are taking it seriously, but no one is really stopping it until a line is crossed, and that line is showing the symbol of the dark of the dark mark, which mm-hmm. is also when all the Death Eaters decide to leave um, because they are fearful of their own master. Yeah, Daddy so, Daddy Valdi basically said, you guys, what the fuck? And they all said, okay, bye. This is our first introduction to the followers. And it is a very scary thing. It's a very, even though we don't see any of them or meet any of them, what is happening, the chaos around Harry that is happening is really intense and terrifying and really sets up like this careless, carelessness to life. Um, this, in, and even though it's like a drunken wizarding event, but it is this awful fear that has spread throughout the entire community to mm-hmm. really f- make everybody, even some really powerful wizards that are at this event scared. Yeah, they're on edge for sure. Every, everyone is terrified um, mm-hmm. and, and allowing it to happen because of their fear. So that really sets up the history of who these Death Eaters are. Mm -hmm. um and and really sets up how the wizarding world looks at them and then later in the next book or later in that same book we actually see them for the first time yeah and Um, they are scary like when we were i think i shared this when we were talking about the the book on stream is that scene where harry is trapped uh with all of those death eaters like it gets my heart going like it is intense it's scary like you really do fear for him you know like uh because you see cedric die like pretty instantly and then it's like oh my gosh what are they gonna do to harry like i mean obviously there's more books and i've read them so i know but still like like that passage is scary it makes you believe that something is really bad about to happen to, to harry really but i think what's really important to to illustrate in this is that it's not the Death Eaters' actions or words that are making the the, the scene fearful. It is their uh, their emotions and regard towards Voldemort mm. and Voldemort and how they're interacting, how that relationship is reacting and interacting. That they are mm-hmm. fearful for themselves uh, of this man that is of pure evil and chaos. Yep. Um, yep. and, and how it is a very serious stoic scene and everyone is differential to this man that they have, that has, fe- that feels betrayed by them. Yep. Um, and it, it sets this scene, but we don't see that evil wickedness so much, but we feel that power that Voldemort has and the intensity that it affects everybody in the scene. Yeah, he wields that for sure. And I and I think like at the end of the fourth book, and what you guys will notice, we'll talk about this a little bit more at the end, but what you guys will notice as we kind of go through the Harry Potter series is I feel like the fourth book set me up with some ridiculous expectations because I slowly in the fifth, sixth, and seventh book start to fall off of really being into the series. And in reality, I was really just into the fandom and I, I really didn't care too much for the series. I mean, I wanted to know what happened to participate in the fandom, but my love started to die. Um, and a huge part of that is because the scariest scenes with the Death Eaters happen in the fourth book. And I just thought like, oh, Harry's getting older. She's taking longer to write these books. It's going to like ratchet up in, in the fear and in the stakes. And it just kind of doesn't. It just doesn't. The scariest moment that hair, the scariest moment in the entire series happens in the fourth book. Yeah. Um, and there are hurtful, there are, there are heartfelt, hard moments throughout the rest of them. There are sick, twisted ideas throughout the rest of them. But this is the moment that is the absolute scariest fear for his life sort of moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is supposed to be ramping up like the way that you say, these characters are supposed to be getting scarier. As war as war penetrates this country, the acts that the people who are involved are supposed to ramp up. And we don't see that. Um, we, and I, and I know I mentioned to you this offline when we were discussing this, but the most gory or horrific acts that we see are not 
by these Death Eaters. None of them, the top two, in my opinion, of the most horrific acts that are actually written on book for us to read as, as readers are not done by Death Eaters. It is Dolores Umbridge making Harry write I Must Not Tell Lies into his own flesh in the fifth book. Oh, and that Harry gets my heart Cass- racing too. <laughs> and Harry casting Sempra Sempra, Sempra uh, at Draco Malfoy as he bleeds out in the bathroom in the sixth book. Mm-hmm, Those mm-hmm. are the scariest, goriest, re- like real intense, violent moments in the book. Uh, and, and there's not a Death Eater in sight. Yeah, I think that the <laughs> the next kind of most intense uh, scene that actually features Death Eaters is, of course, when um, Sirius Black meets his demise. Unfortunately, right? But it's Even not that. Then. It's not like that scary. It doesn't have that. It doesn't have that intense feeling where I truly believe in my heart that Harry is in danger. Like I don't get that from that scene. I mean, it's heartbreaking. And you know, and I yeah. and I I'm sad when I read that scene. Like. I'm sad and I'm upset, but I'm not scared the way that I am at the end of the fourth book. Well, and even the Death Eaters showing up themselves makes it like that's not the scariest part of that chapter. Like the 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 actual mini- Ministry of Matt or the Mysteries, the, the Department of Mysteries, and the obstacles that they have to face is scarier and more intense than the actual Death Eaters showing up and demanding True. that a group of children. Because I think that's the thing, is that this this group is the group that they have and Harry existing in this world are children. And she writes the Death Eaters like they are still treating children that way, Mm -hmm. Uh, which which I get because it's also children's lit uh, and young adult lit. So you can't be violent against the youth. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But it it is hollow because even Lucius Malfoy is acting like Harry is a child. Yeah. who will just hand over a prophecy to him. And even though these kids have proven that they're a legitimate threat, you know, they've proven that. And yet. Um, (laughs) yet. So I think that it's just a, it's a fascinating sort of. um, Yeah. It's a, it's a, yeah, they are all, they're all cats without their claws. They are. Uh, Which is why I loved the Marauders era and fandom so much more is because we can declaw them and to do the truly, horrific horrific things that they are supposedly supposed to have done that we do not see yeah we can put the fangs and the claws back on you know which is kind of what we did and we'll talk more about that at the end after we kind of break down each character um about uh our preferences in regards to putting those claws back on and what we wish we could have seen in canon but um but what made at least for me made me stick with the fandom and become super interested in the marauders era right so okay Shall we start with Wormtail? Yes. Okay, so we have talked about Wormtail, but from the perspective of him as a marauder, not from the perspective of him as a Death Eater. Um, so so Wormtail, as you guys know, is a character that is near and dear to my heart. I think he's fantastic. I think he's one of the most um, well-written and realistic characters in the series. I just think, I think he's great. You know, I think he's great. Um I wish I wish that um, that we had more, you know, more backstory and stuff from him in one sense. But in the other sense, I'm like, wait, no, because every time I ask for it, I get things like wizards pooping on themselves. So, no, I don't want that. It's like, stop, stop. <laughs> yeah, that's Ron's rat. Exactly. Oh, Lumer. Right, yeah. um, so I, so Lan- what do you think about Wormtail like as a as a Death Eater? Like, how does that speak to you? I think Wormtail is the most realistic Death Eater that exists. Um, that the man who is fear, who, who has privilege because he is pure blood or a half blood, uh, that he is scared because of his own lack of power, turning turncoat and siding with the person that he thinks genuinely will win. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then only digging himself deeper because he can't, because he burned a bridge is yeah. I think the most realistic story we see. And therefore everything Wormtail does, including be in hiding, like obviously there's a magical element of him being a rat for, for 11, 13 years. Right. Um, but like he could have, I mean, but if this wasn't magical, he, uh, you mean the, a, a real Wormtail would have done the same thing. Absolutely. Being in hiding, pretending to be someone else, hiding his identity. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, the idea that he is the person who sacrifices his hand in order to bring someone back. 
um it, it, like like the actual bodily sacrifice of himself in order to bring the person who will protect him back uh, yeah. i think is an incredibly realistic character and actually and actually speaks to the desperation of of this of the of the movement of death eaters yeah. um, i mean if you think about it oh sorry go ahead sorry no go ahead i think i, I just think like to add to that that we have in our world, you know, uh, similar types of movements, right? So I mentioned Proud Boys, I mentioned the KKK. If we think about what happened in 2016, a lot of the push for that started on the poll boards on 4chan. And what kind of people do you think are really on the poll boards on 4chan? It's the worm tails of the world. And, you know, I... I hesitate to say this because I don't mean this as a blanket statement, but if you have ever gotten the chance to speak with somebody that actually got involved in these types of things, like in our world, like our world versions of these types of things, um, which I have, and uh, luckily they're all people that don't believe those things anymore, but uh, a lot of times it does come from places of insecurity. It comes from like, I don't belong. It comes from economic distress. It comes from, you know, mental illness that has been untreated and, uh, you know, they don't have proper coping mechanisms. So, you know, they get told like, hey, you want to be on the winning side with the strong guys and, you know, and we're going to win and we're awesome and you can be awesome too. If you just side with us, it's not your fault that you feel this way. It's the muggles fault. You know, they did this. You didn't do this. And um, and so Wormtail is exactly that. I mean, everyone that I can think of that I've ever heard of that fell down to kind of like that alt-right type of situation, like they had a lot in common with Wormtail. Maybe not like how kind of pathetic he is, but like in the sense of what he was feeling inside that caused him to behave this way. Well, I think a lot of people like it's a, that mentality of I am not against like it's that it's a, we see a lot of argument, especially with racism, um, particularly against uh, the people of, of Latinx. I know that uh, of Latinx descent um, yeah. that are moving to this country and stealing jobs. And no one is protecting us sort of mentality that is that is rampant throughout the where I grew up in the Midwest. Um, that it it's this idea of not even hating the person or the race but hating what is being represented by them mm -hmm. uh, and and I think that that's the trap that Wormtail fell into it because you're right I mean he was friends with Lily he knew Muggle and Muggleborns we know that for a fact we, it's canon that he cared deeply about people who he was supposed to hate but the thing is, is that he was looking out for his own protection. And when the and when the Order of the Phoenix and Dumbledore and those people couldn't protect him anymore, uh, he looked for somebody who could. Mm -hmm. And um, and the people who were recruiting were sitting there and saying, "I promise, we're looking out for your best interests. Uh, yeah. You don't have to necessarily agree with everything we're thinking of, uh, but it is. But we're here to protect you." in a way that you might not even be aware that you need protecting in. Uh, and that's the trap that is so rampant in within our country and our system right now too. Yeah, it's just like, it's just like, hey, all those problems that you have, guess what? We have an easy solution. Yep. And the solution is kill all muggles, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, Close and you know, or, yeah. yeah, like the, the solution is, you know, kick out all the brown people, you know, build a wall. Like that's the solution to your economic ills, even though that would never work. <laughs> yeah, obviously it's not the solution because most people, most people who are, you know, undocumented are working the jobs that white people don't want to. Yeah. Be like, I mean, you're not going to like, are you going to go out and pick the raspberry fields in California? I don't think you are really, like, are come you on. Be, you know, a garbage man. Most people who think that they deserve not to be a garbage man would not be willing to be a garbage man. It's like, what well, that is problematic all on its own, but it's the truth of the matter. Yeah. Um, and it's, it, it that is what Wormtail represents within the series. And mm -hmm. because of that, he is the least cartoonish and most realistic character in my head. Yeah. Uh, he, is, he is that person who fell in uh, and is willing to, and, and again, it is like that, oh, I can't remember what the words are. Uh, when you are, when you've 
invested so deeply into something that you no longer like you you're no longer willing to take the loss on it so you'll just keep investing do you oh yeah sunk cost fallacy cost the cost yeah the sunk ca- cost fallacy that's what i 100 percent believe he's been in mm-hmm, like because mm-hmm. even when he brought voldemort back it wasn't about like oh my god my lord i'm so happy to see you and yay we can destroy muggles it's like you'll protect me right mm-hmm. <laughs> I, yeah, can, I never don't have to live as a rat anymore <laughs> He never he never expresses direct interest in the cause. He only expresses interest in himself. And what he'll get out of it. So like his mm-hmm. reward ends up being this beautiful, magical hand that he gets as a replacement that ends up being the thing that kills him. Yeah, tragic. Um, which is a beautiful moment. So good. Uh, <laughs> it's actually one of the really well-written, like long-term mm-hmm. side plots that I'm just like, oh, yeah. Um, and again, this is this is why I just I love the Marauders era so much because we get just enough little bits of all these characters that are just like so well written and well put together. And there's none of the gaps filled in, so they can't be ruined by canon. <laughs> and no, I'm taking our can't tell us we're wrong because we're not wrong. <laughs> yep, because I don't care what anybody says, tweets and Pottermore posts are not text the books are text okay that's how sorry like they're not to me they're not they're just extra editorializing from somebody that can't freaking let go so that's wormtail we love him we stand we stand a rat king all right anything else on wormtail i don't think so i think that's about it okay Okay, Uh, daddy lulu the one who (laughs) fell Uh, i think that this is the second most realistic characterization of someone who would actually be a Mm -hmm. Death Eater. And this is, you know, the Jeff Bezos of the world. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) The the Elon Musks. The really, Mm -hmm. and not even like that rich, but the higher echelon, upper class, old money, traditionalist, don't want anything to change because the system works for me. And I was raised with racist intent. Yeah, sort I imagine of. the Malfoys kind of like I imagine um, the Waltz today, the yes. you know the Disney Walt Disney family. Yeah. So the the Disney family, it's kind of like it's kind of like that. Like individually, maybe they aren't like the most wealthy people in the world, but they're all kind of like collectively incredibly wealthy, and they're all basically trust fund babies. Um, and uh, and they have and there are people in that family that uh, that lean more left. You know, kind of like Draco ends up realizing that like this is not the way. And there's of course people in that family that probably are more like Lucius that are like, nah, this is good. I love being a trust fund baby. And I think this system is fair. Um, So I kind of imagine the Malfoys like that. Yes. No, it is that higher. It is that old money Mm -hmm. born with a silver spoon. And and we're not talking middle class silver spoon. We're talking uh, fuck you money sort of trust funds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, That that were allowed to that didn't that didn't know what was wrong with the system because it never affected them yeah i mean Uh, lucius don't lucius don't need medical insurance like he's good anything that happens to him he's good he's fine and anything that is questioning the power that he has whether it be muggles which is it, it never actually dives into the reasoning why like the the actual like reasons why people feel so so threatened by muggles uh other than this propaganda that we get in the seventh one that is like the idea that you had to steal from a witch or wizard um but like that that's not actually like we never get the death eaters side of what is the propaganda that they're angry about Mm -hmm. other than the fact that these people exist uh so we kind of have to fill in the blanks for that but yeah. at some point, Lucius Malfoy's power was probably questioned or a law that he wanted that benefited him was overturned because it was unfair to muggles or unfair to muggle-borns or, or something like that. Um, it, it, and that just probably instilled and proved the already wrong perception of muggles that he had. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he he signed up ready and willing uh and then when someone said and then and then the fascist uh turns out was more harm than good to even him so that he ended up giving up everything including his own freedom 
uh, his son's life, as far as like being his son, then having to join the Death Eaters um, and everything else too, including his own freaking wand. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and that's, but that's something like what happens to Lucius, like that is realistic of these uh, of fascist movements throughout history, because so many of them, what really makes them go is that they create this enemy and they make you believe that if you get rid of all of, you know, enemy X, then the world's going to get better. But to keep the ideology going, you have to constantly narrow, narrow, narrow who is part of the in group and widen, widen, widen who is part of the out group. And um, people can only be fooled for so long, even fascists themselves, eventually, like they realize, oh, shit, they're coming for me next. <laughs> and so that's kind of what I feel like Lucius's story is, is he's kind of the, the Death Eater that realizes like, oh, no, if we actually got rid of all of the muggles, like that wouldn't stop this. And so, yeah, you know, he's, I... he's directly harmed and he, and he sees that. Yeah, I and I also I also think he he saw it, but he didn't change it. He continued no. to dig in. He continued to be like, "I will do anything to not be the person." Which yeah, he wants point, to be that in that in group. And at the end of the day, he was left hand man that fell from grace to bottom of the to bottom of the barrel because mm -hmm. he fucked up. Uh, he did not please his lord, and he fucked up. And then all of a sudden his wife, his house, his son, everything in his own pride was on the line. Yeah. Um, and he continued to gamble it away almost. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he's kind of like, he's just like, uh, I can't remember the guy's name. I should have looked this up before because I had, I had this thought before. But anyway, you know, like Mussolini used to like cut people out of photos. Like yeah. he's like that. He's like whoever that guy was that Mussolini had edited out of all the photos. <laughs> <laughs> it's like i was never friends with that guy god <laughs> <laughs> and it was like it's like this idea of like voldemort literally took over his house like yeah. took his seat at his dining table unseated him gave him so little power that that because he was so desperate to cling on to the power that he had it, it's another beautiful kind of ending that he was so desperate to cling on cling on to the power that he had that he lost his own power and more power than he ever would have siding with the wrong guy <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah because if he had just like kept being an asshole who was racist and secret uh he probably still would have been on the board of governors for hogwarts and he probably, probably. still would have been influential in the ministry and he still yep. Yep. at the very least would have his money to pay off anything that he needed to <laughs> very true very true um but i think the other thing that 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 lucius has about his character that makes it possible for him to fall is that he really truly does care about his family. For yeah. all of the mean things that he says to Draco, the truth is in his heart of hearts, he cares about his wife and his kid. And um, and even though he does perpetuate a lot of the, the abuse that Draco faces, um, he seems to have this attitude of like, yeah, but no one else is allowed to do that to my kid. And, um, and so he's gonna very, jump in and fix that. It's a very interesting uh, sort of, upper upper class abuse cycle yeah. <laughs> i can use my kid but you better fucking not um mm. <laughs> and i can i can you know tell him how terrible he is but if anybody else does i will fire you yeah it's like um, only i get to talk to him like that like that's that's the attitude and, and maybe my wife does but nobody else and she guys, won't back because... off because <laughs> she's she actually <laughs> how much of an asshole i am to him um <laughs> yeah a, a small a small aside about um narcissa we don't have her on on one of the slides exactly but she's i think not a death eater. yeah she because she's not she's she not never, technically she a death eater mm -hmm. so yeah, she's not technically, but I think I think it's important that um, that the story has characters of like you know supportive spouses and things like that. I do lament that there's not more um, canon women Death Eaters. We'll talk about that when we get to our Lestrange boys and kind of circle back to Landon and I's story. But I will say um, that I do think Narcissa also is very realistic in the sense of like um, you know. It, it, 
these people that have these awful beliefs do tend to have people supporting them that don't necessarily believe the same thing because it's just so commonplace and embedded in the culture. And I feel like that's what's happened in the wizarding world. These This idea of, um, of magic supremacy is so embedded into the culture that, um, that it doesn't really matter uh, if you agree or disagree with those political beliefs. You know, you're still going to end up with that. Lucius Rhymes is delicious. True, Jane. Very true. He's so daddy. It's, and it's, in my opinion, it is 100% this actor. Yeah. 100% this actor. Oh my God. He's so good. Uh, He's so I good. I, I love myself a good, a good Malfoy boy, uh, but <laughs> Lucius is a little too much for me. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Not me. Call me. That's Call Karen. Uh, I'm Lucius, right here. So give it to me anytime thank you so much mm-hmm. uh, i'll be waiting for your call um <laughs> it'll be great <laughs> yeah i had weird taste as a kid but i don't remember being all eyes emoji in the books that's because in the books he doesn't have this like swagger whereas like in the movie version of lucius like he he adds all of that he adds all of that like that like um you know i guess for lack of a better word he adds all of that big dick energy um it, yeah. it, it, it doesn't exist in the books it, it doesn't yeah. you know book lucius malfoy is literally copy and paste of draco malfoy and mm-hmm. you because you're reading draco malfoy as an adult acting like a 12 year old like him and arthur weasley get in a fist fight yeah they do they fight. <laughs> that's canon like that's canon so and like, i can't imagine know, movie lucius doing that <laughs> the book this is the book after draco and harry go to have a fight in the middle of the night uh mm-hmm. arthur weasley and lucius malfoy two full-grown men with their children in front of them have a fist fight in a bookstore like yeah. it's they it doesn't it's literally they copied and paste pasted 12 year old draco and tried to sell him as an adult mm-hmm. and that's why book book lucius is just like not great uh and fan and lucius uh, whether he be whether people tie into the good side of him or the bad side of him, fan and Lucius and movie Lucius, hundred percent better. Oh yeah, movie Lucius is definitely my favorite Lucius, and any any um fandom Luciuses that build off of movie version, that's where I'm gonna be like, oh yes, I'm here for this. <laughs> that's the thing, that Lucius Malfoy needs to have high charisma. That is the point of him. Yeah. He's a charismatic character. And that's why he was able to talk himself out of facing, like they caught him red-handed as a Death Eater with the Death Eater mark on him. They caught him red-handed and he still is an incredibly powerful wizard because he literally charmed his way out of it. He also paid, but he charmed mm-hmm. his way out of it too. I mean, he's he's uh, he's, kiss, he's kissing those coins as he's like putting them down, you know, yeah. in front of the people that need to get paid. Like that's how he yeah. is. Just to throw D and D in there, he's got a plus five mo- modifier on those like charisma checks. Like, oh yeah, he's there, um, proficient in everything. So mm-hmm. <laughs> for sure, uh, he absolutely that, is. That's a hundred percent shown in the movie and not in the book. Yeah, that's a invention invention from the actor, not canon in the text. Uh, do we want to do we want to take a hop, skip, and a leap over to his sister in law? Yes, let's do it. Oh, thank you so much for contributing, Kendra. Boop, boop. our favorite. Okay, I love Bella. Can I just say, I love Bella. I, Did you watch the reunion special on HBO? I, uh, my friend and I have only watched half of it. So we have not, okay. either, we're in the first half of the series, not the second Okay, half. wait, I have to tell everybody this. Okay, you've got to find a clip online of um, Daniel Radcliffe and Helena Bonham Carter talking- Oh my God, Daniel Radcliffe has the biggest boner for Helena Bonham Carter and he always has. And like he shoots, he shot, he reads this letter where he shoots his shot um, as a child. And she of course like ignores it because he's a freaking child, right? But in the reunion, well, Daniel Radcliffe's not a child no more. And he shoots a shot again. And Helena basically goes, "Mm, call me baby. It's so good. So it's, she's very much like, please call me. So uh, good. It's so good. He shoots his shot and she says, sure. Like, talk to, let's let's go get coffee. Like basically that's what she says. Um now I don't know if it was like for the camera or whatever, and if you know, <laughs> but like y'all, maybe in a couple months, Daniel Radcliffe and Helena Bonham Carter are gonna be dating. Like they might, you know. <laughs> maybe 
<laughs> or at least fucking. Or at least mm. fucking. Um, the thing about Bellatrix is that I have always had like this is a this is a stereotypical character that I've always loved. Uh, very similar to Drusella in Buffy, mm-hmm. where that is that woman whose sycophant's belief in power and those who have it has driven her, them mad. Mm-hmm. Um, and she embodies that so beautifully well. Uh, and this character could not have been played by anyone other than than Helena. No, she's fantastic. Like my favorite part is not even really from her. It's whenever, um, whenever they, it's, well, I mean, she's acting in it, right? But it's like, when they take the polyjuice and they're pretending, like Hermione's pretending to be her. And the way that they did the scene, of course, is like Bellatrix did the scene as Bellatrix would do it. And then, uh, you know, um, shoot, I lost her name. Hermione's, the yeah, actress. Uh, yes, um, yeah, um, Emma yeah, yeah, Emma Watson comes in and like basically copies as well as she can what Helena Bonham Carter just did. And it's like the most amazing thing like they basically just filmed it a couple of times so they were like copying each other and you get this like insane mix of um emma watson and helena bottom carter like doing this together as bellatrix and it's just like anyway it's the best scene and i love it and and helena's amazing in it no it's it's she's such a great actress uh yeah. but to talk about the character because we could fan girl about helena sorry i just really love her and this is one of her best I roles talk about her forever forever if I could. Uh, I love her so much. But Bellatrix, the character, um, is a woman who has gone mad. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that is, it it is interesting that she is the only female Death Eater. Uh, There's a lot of things that the connotation that she's the only female Death Eater and then also canonically loves Voldemort, which is a ship I, I like and I know Karen hates. Yeah, we're um, going to talk about that in a second. After we talk about Bellatrix herself, I already told Landon I want to talk about Bellamort versus Belladolphus. We're going to get to that in a second. Uh, and and I understand the the hating of it, but uh, she is just so bought in. And this is where she becomes cartoony, right? So she is this mad woman who is the only woman who could support this man is what we're basically told. Um, mm-hmm. All of them, all the other women are wives who are deferential to their husbands. Mm -hmm. um she is the only woman and she is in fucking sane she is a sadist uh she enjoys and gets off on torture of people like she is just not human she is a cartoon version of an evil person yeah Um, she's like Voldemort in the sense that she's absorbed so much dark magic that she just like she's not a real person anymore yes and she is you know loyal to the very end and it's because she really wants to ride that dick um and <laughs> it's not why it's not why <laughs> it's not why uh and first child isn't canon either <laughs> fight me uh, it's not <laughs> oh uh, i will call whoever says first child is canon um <laughs> but no she also is is she's just a she's a cartoon character like she's she's like, what would an evil villain woman look like written in the nineties uh, or in the early two thousands? And it's like, yeah, it would be this, it would be this batshit insane person because only women who are crazy are women who are capable of evil things. Yeah, uh, and that's what we were told, and that's why so many of us are evil now. It's true, and I think, and I just think like uh, the fact that there is only one female canon Death Eater, um, it's kind of like a, a hindsight thing. Like we see what. JK Rowling thinks of women and gender issues now and we look back and go hmm that makes sense she only made one and believes that there wouldn't be any other women that followed uh Voldemort you know it makes sense that she would believe that because she really does not believe that the genders are equal she doesn't obviously (laughs) um yeah and like I would have loved because like I do agree that as far as perhaps front lines uh the way so the way that a lot of the society is built also is also very patriarchal Mm -hmm. very much like ours but even worse um i would say uh, in pure blood society so uh, there should be other supporters that might have been different than bellatrix yeah like I would have um, loved, like a, a great way to fix this that would have still been in canon is, you know, we have um, towards the the latter books, uh, Amicus and Electo 
come in and and you know she is technically a female death eater but they those twins get like no development none whatsoever they're basically just names um they could be anyone and i and i just feel like a good fix for like the the bella being like kind of the only female death eater would have been to develop amicus and electo a little bit more and you could have shown like another way that a woman became a death eater but they're like footnotes so <laughs> we don't get that that is me having an electo flashback in that moment. Oh my god! <laughs> oh, so much I forgot. Oh, anyway, sorry, off topic. Um, <laughs> but no, I think yeah, being able to develop them more um, and differently, like even the a little bit of electo that we do see in the movies, we see it more than we do in the books. Um, is still shit batshit crazy. Like that's the only representation is in order to be a woman yeah. who supports us, you have to be batshit crazy, uh, in order to lose any sort of morality and just go throwing curses here there and everywhere uh and sing and sing song or fuck your brother like those are the options <laughs> pretty much <laughs> i mean by the way that's what that by the way that's canon that's not fan and that's that happened in the books you guys didn't see that part the twin cest i mean 100 <laughs> percent happened uh <laughs> fight me anyway um, <laughs> but no and i and it's like this idea of worship too that the yeah. only like bellatrix is also the only death eater that we see truly worship voldemort mm -hmm. everybody else is scared of him mm -hmm. everybody else is fearful and differential to him and, and notices his power and does not think they could defeat him and in some ways rebels against him she is the only one who worships him the way that he wants to be worshipped, which is direct, con like direct, it, it's not, it doesn't make sense to the story that we're being told. Mm -hmm. That's what we're told that her followers are supposed to look like, is the Bellatrix Lestrange. But we don't see any of them other mm -hmm. than Bellatrix. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's- it almost it almost feels like it and i know we'll come we'll come back to this again but it's just it's another great example of how i i know jk rowling was trying to write evil villains in a kids book and that's hard like and i don't i don't necessarily have a fix for it but it just goes back to like how kind of toothless the death eaters really are um even like bellatrix is really the only one that's truly devoted that truly believes yeah and and it's <sighs> it's just it's an interesting take and i wish i wish we had i i love her story so bellatrix's story is a, the three sisters uh bellatrix is the eldest although i always thought andromeda was the eldest but i have been corrected about that recently yep um, she's the eldest bellatrix, bellatrix is, the eldest. is the eldest andromeda is the middle child and narcissus or narcissa is the uh, youngest child. All three of them mm -hmm. were raised, no brothers. So there, there was an expectation that they would marry within the pure blood family uh, and follow the the good wives sort of directive of the time. Yeah. They were all uh, supposed to be trad wives, basically. Yeah. And Bellatrix did. Uh, she did until she found the cause, and then she was more loyal than her husband, and so rose above in the cause. Mm -hmm. uh, but was an incredibly like the thing is is that all three of them were incredibly powerful, very smart and bright, and were basically being devoted to housewives. Yeah, um, they were too good for it, and so you know only Narcissa really succeeded <laughs> at the task. Yeah. And the reason why Narcissa <laughs> had to is because Andromeda left. She married mm -hmm. a, she married a Muggleborn, uh, mm -hmm. and and disowned her own family so that her family in return disowned her uh yeah. and that so and narcissa that, saw that and she was like well i can't do what i want i guess i have to do the trad wife thing <laughs> yeah. and that also grew bellatrix's anger and mm -hmm. hate and resentment because she lost her sister to the to the muggles um and and that weakness that they were again instilled as the black family to not be weak uh the, the most the most uh powerful house of black mm -hmm. um and and that was against everything Bellatrix thought. So that like added to the madness. And then of course, when we actually interact with with Bellatrix, she has been locked in Azkaban, the most depressing place in the world, in basically isolation for twelve years. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So her mind is fried because she's been around Dementors for so long. Yes. Um. But but the things that we're told is that she was, and that's the other thing too, is that like she doesn't do anything bloodthirsty we are told how incredibly bloodthirsty this woman is and the most thing the most 
bloodthirsty thing she does is is throw a Cruciatus curse at Harry. Um, and uh, she does carve into Hermione's skin. Um, <laughs> just remembered that in the seventh one. Yeah, that's, that but does happen. That does, that happen. does happen. But, but that's I mean, probably the worst thing that she does is to Hermione. Well, yeah, that we see on that we see on page. Uh, the worst mm-hmm. thing I think she does is that she tortures, she tortures uh, Frank and Alice Longbottom. Yeah, but we don't see that. that. We never yeah. see that. But we are told all of these sadistic things that she's done, and nothing, nothing ever raises to that level except in the seventh. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm really struggling obviously we haven't read the seventh one i'm really struggling to remember what was movie and what was which what was movie what was book (laughs) yeah it's hard to remember she did like carve she carved with the wand and with i think she carved with a wand in book and in movie she carved with a knife Mm. um and i can't remember yeah so i think well we'll we'll figure out that that question when we get to the seventh book because i don't remember either i couldn't tell you but but, i mean (laughs) goes to show as far as like there's this bloodthirsty torturous woman who is supposed to like be monstrous and crazy and we never see that no we don't we, we don't see really the songy and the mr potter sort yeah. of aspect of everything which is great by the way i just would have liked to also see a little bloodshed you know and and i get that like <laughs> this is a kid's movie or whatever and it's kids books and so they just don't want to get that intense but well, um there but if they're going to get level. it with anybody, it should have been this character. And there is a certain level of show don't tell. Yeah. Like, and you can, you can tell it in a way that you're also showing it, that you can build drama and dramatic thing. But again, they defanged her. And, and mm-hmm. to the extent that I don't think they needed to. Yeah. Um, like that, there was, a, there was an opportunity in the ministry to make her fucking terrifying. Um, to make her the stuff of, of, the boogeyman sort of level and you could write that way you can write a character that way and it'd still be considered pg-13 mm-hmm. writing um but jkr doesn't have that ability to but see the thing is is like when she writes action scenes they're really really yeah. good oh. so here's the thing that just popped into my head maybe this is why maybe she did write some at some point some death eater torture scenes and they were just too much <laughs> and then she had to cut them <laughs> Because I, I feel like if she did, they would have been a lot. I think the other theory is too is that um, nothing in this book is supposed to be scarier than Voldemort. Yeah. And the problem is is that Voldemort, we see we see Voldemort three times in the series. We see him in the fourth, we see him in the fifth, and we see him in the seventh. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we see childhood Voldemort throughout the six. But but as far as like a face down with Harry versus Voldemort, and that is supposed to be terrifying, scary, and then something Harry can overcome. Mm-hmm. Um, and and when you have those high moments that nothing can be at that level, it's really hard to then find a balance of something that is less than that, but also more than uh, a, a dog without a bite. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and that's and that might also be where she had trouble with. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I think mm-hmm. I think it's most seen in Bellatrix that we are told that this this woman will do anything, and we see her taking and then she won't. Steps. Yeah, she doesn't, but then she doesn't, right? So, speaking of Voldemort, <laughs> speaking of Voldemort, so here's the other thing about Bellatrix that really bothers me: if you take um, the the idea that she was in love with Voldemort. And that cursed child is canon and all of this. Essentially, what that means is the reason why she was so devoted to the cause is because she was in love with Voldemort. And that must be to then if you extrapolate that, that's kind of like, oh, well, that's why there's no other women, because to actually become that devoted, you have to fall in love with Voldemort. Otherwise, like you couldn't actually care about the cause. And this is why I hate Bellamort. Okay, so here's my fandom solution that I think is um much more relevant to why Bellatrix and Rodolphus never had children, right? Because if 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 you take Bellatrix is in love with Voldemort, okay, well, that's why Bellatrix and Rodolphus never ended up having kids, right? Because she wasn't really that interested in him. And by the way, Rodolphus was really young when they got married and Bellatrix was older. Um, that's canon too. So this is my this is my this is my thought. On the on that, I think it's much more likely 
that um, either like Rodolphus was impotent or that like um, Bellatrix didn't want to have kids and there was maybe some magical abortions going on. Or like I prefer very much solutions like that to answer the question of like why Rodolphus and Bellatrix didn't have kids because it doesn't really make any sense. If they really truly believe in all of this blood supremacy stuff, they would want more um, pure blood kids to exist. They would have had kids. You know, it's kind of a little bit of a plot hole um, that fandom kind of wants to try to fix, and it's definitely a plot hole that that I have the urge uh, to fix. So. Bella Dolph is all the way. Uh, Bella Moore is, sorry, Landon, but it's true. It's lazy. I don't like oh, it. I I think that there is an interesting aspect to Bella Mort that can exist without it being, you know, resulting in a child. Um, true. I, I, like, and that's the thing is that I don't want, Mel I don't want Bella Mort to result in a child. Um, and I also don't want Voldemort to love Bella back uh but also just something that I I wanted to oh oh my gosh hang on man and I can't hear you thank you so much for the raid um not not the nil we're talking about Death Eaters today Hello, um Death Eaters. welcome not the nil. oh you must be from Elixir okay wait I didn't type your name right let me give you a shout out um not the nil thank you so much for the raid um, so happy to have you here. We uh, we do this we do this sort of thing on um, on uh, Saturdays where it's more of like a podcast type of thing where Landon and I talk about a topic. That's our typical Saturday stream. It's called Interstage Window. Um, today we're talking about Harry Potter Death Eaters. Tap Water recommended Sano Hughes too. Ah, oh, thank you so much, Tap. You guys should also go follow Tap Water. Let's let's shout out Tap Water. Um, he's awesome. He his streams are incredibly entertaining and um, and he likes. Uh, tabletop and Pokemon and a lot of the things that we like here. So you guys should definitely be following Tapwater. Uh, so... Oh, yeah, here we go. He's playing uh, Legends uh, Arceus right here. Oh, Potato Mochi. I, if I never see another Potato yeah, Mochi in my life, here. it will be too soon. Like every freaking meal go. they eat in this game is the freaking right? Potato Mochi. <laughs> I love it so much. <laughs> All right, the clip is still playing. I'll tell you when it's uh, done, Landon, and they can hear you. <laughs> Thank you so much, and thank you so much for the wow, Jane. Um, the shout out thing went on top of it. It looks like, but uh, but I heard it. I heard the wow. It's going great. It's going great. We're talking about Bellatrix. Oh no, the shout out seems to be frozen. Hang on. What's going on? What's happening? Uh, why are you frozen? Why are you frozen? I don't know why it's frozen, but it's not talking anymore. Um, so anyway, uh, back to Bellamort. Tell us what you, no, again, I what was, you like about Bellamort. Well, I was just noticing a theme that I wanted to mention off very quickly because you you kind of hinted so towards that. Nice. But it's very fascinating that, that JKR purposely chose until Cursed Child, but again, not canon, um, chose to make her two most evil characters incapable of reproduction. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> and I do love Voldemort, and I do love the oh, idea of like Voldemort's too really? evil to have kids. I'm I'm all here for that. I'm um, if we're gonna if we're gonna do Bellamort, that flavor is my preferred flavor. It is my preferred flavor. Uh, I also love like a good asexual Voldemort who has no who is so like removed from. It's not even asexuality. He's just so removed from human human essence that he can't feel those feelings but is charming enough and manipulative enough that he knows how to control the people in his lives including making a woman fall head over heels in order to manipulate her to do whatever he, she, he wanted her to do i mean i have to tell you asexual <laughs> aromantic voldemort is my favorite <laughs> flavor of voldemort um <laughs> It so makes, yes <laughs> it, it makes sense as far as like obviously hold on very quickly want to sit there and not equate the two things asexuality and aromanticism is valid 100 percent uh oh yeah i don't want anyone to get the idea that we no. think that you have to have trauma or some kind of weird thing to to be ace you don't no. um mm -hmm. but is, uh yeah it is valid but i do have to say that if we're going with the theory that voldemort was reproduced under a love potion and that is like it changed him and his physicality to be incapable of loving and and his quest for power also came from an area of not caring about reproduction or furthering any line or anything like that 
Um, I think that it like that makes him so removed from human very much mm-hmm. like his emotions did. And maybe also the, the aspect of getting rid of Horcruxes and breaking his soul par- played a part in that. But we have to remember that the Voldemort we see is not the Voldemort that did raise all of these allies. The Voldemort that raised all of those allies was a very handsome young man who was known for manipulation tactics. Mm-hmm. Was I mean, when we when we see child all. Voldemort, like, you know, he's a cute kid. So we can definitely extrapolate that yeah. Voldemort before the Horcruxes was attractive. And also Tom Riddle, the actor who plays Tom Riddle uh, in the second movie is one of yeah. the most attractive actors that we have in the entire series yeah like he's incredibly good oh looking. fun fun fact to bring it back to um to joseph morgan as we talked about did you know joseph morgan tried out for a young tom riddle he didn't get it but wouldn't Love that have been that amazing he could have been he could have been he would have nailed it he didn't make it obviously because he's not in the movie but he would have been that's a good fine. one that's mm-hmm. fine <laughs> um, but, but no, I think that I that is the flavor of Bellamort that I love is that you have this incredibly charismatic young man who is who is rising to power and is willing to manipulate any person into supporting him that he can, um, including a young woman who is more powerful than her station allows her to be, who is more success, who who has craved to be more successful than than a wife. Mm-hmm. And a man who is attractive and good looking and can promise her all of these things, giving her a time and attention and him knowing that he can use human emotions to manipulate her. Yeah, I mean, to me. <laughs> if we're going to have Bellamort, that's the flavor I like, not cursed child flavor where they have a, a baby yeah. and, there's a, and there's some kind of like legitimacy to their relationship. There's not. There's not. Okay. The reason why I think ultimately I still prefer Bella Dolphus is because in Bellamort, there is no good Bellamort that keeps um, what I see as uh, as Bellatrix's alpha energy. Okay. Yeah, so it, uh, it, but- it totally strips her of that. And whereas when you have Bella Dolphus, because he's, you know, he's younger, I can imagine a Rodolphus that's quite enamored with this like powerful witch of a wife that he somehow magically landed and, um, and, uh, and she can keep that alpha energy. I love that alpha energy. However, canonly, we do see that she is not alpha around Voldemort. I mean, that's true. She is willing to to take herself down, uh, which A, I hate, but also B, makes it part of that complicated relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, And also explains the sycophantness, like how much she is willing to worship him. Uh, Because there is the level of love and obsession that comes with that. And I like the idea of it being a fault of Voldemort, like not to make her a victim, but I like the idea that it was not her own obsession that was her downfall, but encouragement from him. Oh um, yeah, for was sure. Manipulated. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, also like ship Bella and Rodolphus. I get it. I shipped it in our RP. <laughs> That's because it was good. <laughs> Fantastic. Also, you're hot, Jane. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I just think I just think that like um I I love everything that you're saying about Bella Dolphus. I just prefer it when it's like all of that energy directed towards the cause as opposed to towards a romance. Yeah, and I think it becomes one and the same, right? Like I think at some point, especially when he stops giving back, it's like what can I do for the cause? It's that obsession. Mm-hmm. It's that it's mm-hmm. that thing. Um but that's my hot take. And uh, I also support Alpha Bella energy uh, and Helena Bohemia Carter could just come suffocate me and I'd be happy. Right. She definitely has like, please step on me um, energy, right? 100%. Dan, I'm rooting for you. I'm rooting for you. You can do it. You can do it. If you were able to hit it, Dan, I know you're watching. If you were able to, when so many of us queer young women want to i support it a hundred percent and i congratulate you sir um yeah. thank you so much you can do it we believe <laughs> in you hopefully you treated her like she deserves to be treated oh my god I, it, I would die i would die if dan rat daniel radcliffe or helen bomb carter ever 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 somehow got popular enough for them to watch this shit um i think i would just i think i would they just won't die. but dan you're you're watching this right now i know it oh my god stop um, it <laughs> 
<laughs> well, so right. we love we love Bellatrix. We absolutely love Bellatrix. She's definitely like as far as Death Eaters go that actually have canon development, which most of them don't. Um, she is a favorite, one hundred percent. Definitely yeah. what drew me in um, to being interested in that that part of the plot. And also, by the way, this is the moment where we stop having character develop canon development because that's it. So those are the three and Barty Crouch Jr. But we talked enough about yeah, him. Yeah, we talked. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't put Barty in here because we talked about him so much last in the yeah, episode the, for the fourth. Those are the four Death Eaters that get any sort of um, any sort of like development other than Draco Malfoy, who I would not consider a Death Eater, even though he took the mark. Uh, fight me. I will meet you in the alley out back. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to argue that, even though, I mean, he still did and he still is technically, but I hear what you're saying and I respect your energy. Um, but there is an honorable mention Death Eater that has a little bit of there, development. There yeah. Uh, and we, Here we, we go. talk about fandom's favorite sad boy. Uh, that is the traitor, aka R.A.B., aka Regulus Black. Yeah, R.I.B. is great. So we haven't gotten to this part of the book yet. So Landon, if you could refresh everyone's memory on who Regulus is and what he does in the story, what his purpose is in the story. Regulus Black is a Sirius Black's younger brother um, who is two years younger. And during the uprising of the war, he, he became the youngest Death Eater ever. Uh, due to his popularity or due to his own skill of being very smart, very witty, and very talented in the magical field, much like his older brother Sirius, but also to fill the shoes that Sirius left when Sirius left the family. And then, and then therefore the Blacks didn't have any child to support Voldemort's cause when it came time to it. So mm -hmm. um, as a child still, he was still under even wizardy legal league age. Uh, Regulus Black took the dark mark and became uh, a Death Eater, and mm -hmm. he was he was never really the closest to him, but he was definitely inner circle to Voldemort. Um, and again, lived with the pressure of the Black family name and fortune on him. Uh, he was the youngest of his dying parents. Sirius had abandoned him in his eyes, um, and he had expectation piled high on his shoulders uh until until something clicked mm -hmm. um and about two years um after you know about two years into the war he realized that this was not what he supported and what he wanted uh and that Voldemort the man that he was following was it was a monster who was making horcruxes mm -hmm. uh and so he discovered one uh, didn't tell anybody, discovered one, discovered where it was hidden, uh, and in his final moments, hunted it down, took along his house elf, family house elf creature to, uh, to swap it out and let creature survive while he died and become, and be, and ultimately became an inferi. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is the story of Regulus Black. Absolutely tragic. Absolutely tragic. The fandom loves to ship him with Barty Crouch Jr., um, which I'm also here for. James <laughs> yeah, also with James, also here for that. I like to imagine that Regulus um, was somebody that joined purely due to pressure, so yes. young. I, I think that even though uh, he felt that Sirius abandoned him. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty obvious. I think he still tried to keep up with what Sirius was doing. I think he saw what, you know, that Andromeda made a different decision and that Sirius made a different decision and those, those different decisions were possible. I like to believe that Regulus was one of the few people that didn't believe Sirius did it. I, I really don't think he did just for I the few things that we have on Regulus and Canon. We, I, I just don't also, think he did. He was not alive. Yeah. At that time. He died before Sirius. He died before uh, the Potters did. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Um, that's true. So he was never he was alive. A, well, he was, he lived as an Inferni, I guess. I don't know whether you would consider yeah. that alive Although, I mean, he alive. was, I mean, he was dead under the lake until a spell woke him up, basically. That's true. Yeah. Um, so he had no idea what was happening. That's but, true. Um, so I like, but I like to believe that, like, he, yeah. he held in, he held that, uh, the truth in his heart and like just watched Andromeda and uh, and Sirius go through what they went through and and took inspiration from that. Yeah, I think that he represents um a different so we see three young men uh learn 
the differences of their father's and family's opinion. We see Sirius who literally leaves in a puff of smoke on a motorcycle with the middle finger up in the air. Like we see that Gryffindor rebellion of fuck you, fuck this, I'm out of here sort of Mm -hmm. aspect uh, of a boy who never really fit in. And then we see Draco Malfoy who loses everything and realizes he's on the wrong side uh, due to the fact that he's going through so much loss. Uh, and then Regulus is his own sort of person who who was handed the legacy that he was who he was raised with, who had to handle everything his brother left behind uh, in an incredibly abusive situation, mm-hmm. um, where he had to live up to the social pressure of everything that he was raised with. He had to live up to the pressure of his own expectations. Um, he had no other lifeline but Sirius to help him and at that point Sirius Mm -hmm. had been burned off the family map and had left in a blaze of smoke and a middle finger up in the air uh and and he didn't have anybody or anything to support him so I do believe I do believe he never believed in the cause that he was doing what he was supposed to be doing what he thought he was doing in order to make up for the fact that Sirius didn't uh, that younger sibling sort of mentality of, or even just a si- the responsible sibling mentality of my sibling cannot do this. So I will take on what I must in order to overcome. Yeah. Um, if there was the theme song, surface pressure would be Regulus was Black's theme song. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Regulus, Regulus is one of those characters that, um, that uh, I, I lament the fact that he is not one of the main Death Eater characters that we really get to know because what little we know about him is just so good. It's just, it's so good that I just, I, I want more, you know, he's definitely one of those characters where I just, I am constantly left feeling like I want to know more about what Regulus thought and what Regulus, why Regulus did what he did from his perspective. Uh, and fandom fills in the gaps great, uh, but it, the, on, the only sort of development we ever get is a note. Yeah. That's it. A note and, and how Creature, who is an antagonist throughout the series, views him uh, and is very loyal and loving to him. So it's an interesting juxtaposition of this man was, the, this is the take of someone who is, who killed Sirius, who helps to kill Sirius. So we instantly don't trust him, but also everything that we've gathered and all the information we have is that in the end, Regulus Black was was the traitor who saved, who 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 helped destroy yeah. Voldemort. Yeah, he did. Because without the things that he that he did, um, that you know, that's one one more step. That's one more step that would have been harder for um, you know, all of the uh, for Harry and his friends. You know, if Regulus hadn't did what he did, I just think I think Regulus must have been a person that just didn't talk much. You know, just didn't really make his feelings known much, and I think that makes him very compelling. No, and if I Death think- Eaters have a, had a larger role in the books, I could better understand the satanic panic that happened when they came to America. Woo, Kendra. Woo. <laughs> um, I I think that yeah, I think Regulus Black was a. I am here because I have to be here, yeah. rather than I believe to be here. Um, mm-hmm. and because we see no development of him, uh, and because I feel that that is such a rare situation to be in. He is still, again, he is a, he, this sort of thing doesn't happen as often in hate groups as we would like to think they do. Um, But this, the sort of like, I don't know, you, you get right. I mean, maybe, maybe the person who's raised in vicious hate that comes to realize that that hate is wrong is the story. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know necessarily about that. I think the the closest parallel that I can think of as someone that um, that grew up in the South where church culture is very important, I think about um, people that become apostates as adults, I think is very, very common. Um, somewhat happened to me, and I can think of a lot of people that I know that this happened to that were, you know, raised Christian um, as teenagers. They, you know, got more and more into it because it's very nice. If you, you like, you belong and it feels nice and there's, you know, a community built in and, and, um, and you have activities you can do all the time and, and things like that, you know, built in social services right which is very important for a teenager and then kind of when you start to get into your later teens maybe early 20s for some people and and you don't 
need as much of that kind of social circle or those activities or need that feeling of belonging quite as much anymore, then you're kind of like, oh, wow, I got real deep into that. Maybe that's not really me. And I kind of feel like that's what Regulus goes through, only if instead of going through it with a religious group, he goes through it with a hate group, of course. Yeah. Um, but that's that's what I think about. That aspect does happen, but it's more of like the, hey, I'm going to then sacrifice my life in order to take mm -hmm. this person down. Yeah, like that's intense, that, of course. That makes him uh, an, an, a cartoon version of of what this actually would look like. Yeah. Um, but again, again, the 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 characters, the characters that we know the li only little bits about in Harry Potter are the most fascinating characters, right? They are. We love them so much. Um, yeah. Also, someone explain James and Rab to me, or James and Rab to me. Uh, I don't understand it. <laughs> I don't I mean I don't see what the problem is. Like, I mean, he was he's a serious little do brother. I see, do I see what the problem is? No. Do I understand it? Absolutely not. But maybe that's because I just am so jelly blind. I mean, um, you are very, you are very jelly blind. I don't know. I mean, when I've seen people do James and Rab, I guess I had no, um, or sorry, James and Reg, I, I had no like strong feelings about it, but I'm, I'm not like, I'm not like, oh, I hate this. You know, it's fine. Yeah. I'm like, shit, whatever. I'm just very much like, I like him and Barty though. Reg and Barty is cute. Reg and Barty is really good because they're both young. Like Barty's relatively young in the in the Death Eater group as well. And um, not as young as Regulus, but they both have this idea of pressure put upon them. Mm -hmm. uh, Regulus by his family, Barty by his his father, and the expectations mm -hmm. on there uh, in the same groups. And I have a feeling believing the level of vitriol and hate towards the cause at the same level where it's like this is kind of just the thing that we do Barty, mm. <laughs> Barty in order to rebel against his family and Reg in order to like support his family this is kind mm -hmm. of just it uh mm -hmm. and then I like to think that if they had actually successfully stayed in each other's lives and uh Reg hadn't died and left Barty alone forever that maybe just maybe they both would have gotten out um maybe. and they didn't and yeah that's Harry Potter happened. <laughs> but that's totally fanon. There is no Barty Reg in canon. The fan this is like the fan episode. Everything <laughs> true. here is canon and or fanon. Oh, one other thing I have to say about Regulus is I love that current fandom has Timothy Chalamet basically as the way that he looks in Dune as Regulus. I just think that is amazing I, fan like, casting. Literally, we were talking about this when we were making the outline, and I was just like, who do we want to? Because he's not in the books, so who do we want to put as Rab as Reg? Yeah, and there's no, there's no like official know. Regulus Black art. He's not really in the movies. So I, um, so I googled it. I googled it, and it was Timothy Chalamet. It was my boy Timothy, and I was just like, oh, this is yes, this is perfect. <laughs> this is yeah, it's so good. Name. Uh, <laughs> I love it so much. <laughs> mm -hmm. Here for it. I think it's a all great right. face claim for him. Shall we talk okay, about next the boys who are the most loyal of all. Okay. We told you guys we love Vampire Diaries, right? Like we told you. So, <laughs> um, so we didn't write their names on the slide because we would like to reveal to you this is Rodolphus and Rebastian Lestrange, the it way is. that we like to portray them. I also wanted to include in the slide like Dollahoff and Crab and Goyle and all the names that we hear that exist within the books. Mm -hmm. Uh, mainly the five that escaped from Azkaban because they were the ones who never really hid what they yeah. were about, which is why uh, uh, the Lestrange brothers are on here. Yeah. Um, and oh, the, Lunar, uh, fun fact. we, Me and Landon have done um, Amicus and Electo role plays before too, and we've used a variety of different face claims. But one of the face claims that I really like for Amicus and Electo is um Haley and Tyler from Vampire Diaries so can't do Tyler. fun fact could not do Tyler <laughs> yeah I know we changed him for you but I'm a fan I like I it do, I do like it it's a good one it was back when Vampire Diaries was everybody's FCs mm -hmm. uh oh god Amicus and Electo I'm back on that thing um <laughs> someone give me my murder twins mm -hmm. um I just need to write a book that's just needs what be what happens yeah anyway. I think so I, Rabistan and Rodolphus are just, 
I think we don't, the only, the only other sibling interaction and or relationship that we see within the Death Eaters, even though it is incredibly family focused, incestual thing of pure blood wizardry, but also that everybody who believes in this stuff can only have sex and marriage and children with each other. Um, we only see one other sibling and that's Narcissa and Bellatrix. Yeah. Uh, so it's just very fascinating that we get to see Rodolphus and Raviston who in the books are arrested for torturing uh, Frank and Alice or being there during the torture of Frank and Alice. Um, Everybody was there. That was a party. It was. It was them, <laughs> Bella and Barty Crouch. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, the only like the only sort of thing and sense we get from the books of them is Bellatrix yelling at Barty to stay proud um, and Rodolphus looking very like, yes, I'm here. You're going to fucking put me in jail. Okay, try it. Uh, and Raviston looking young and meek. <laughs> and that's it. That's all we get from them. Mm -hmm. uh, so we transformed that. <laughs> Yeah, we did. We totally transformed it. So, um, so Landon, what is Rebastian's favorite spell, you know, way to do things? Like, what, what's his thing? What's he like? It might be completely muggled, but Rebastian likes to use knives. Yeah. Um, he's, he's got a little thing for blood. Uh, and he really likes art. He's an artist at heart and, um, really just likes to make artwork out of, you know, the things that he is really passionate about, whether that be killing people or just, you know, wanting to make a mosaic of some sort, uh, usually out of organs. Um, <laughs> he's so, he's a little serial killery. Um, and his favorite muse is his is this girl that he met at school, uh, Abby or Abigail Knott, mm -hmm. um, who is a sibling of another reference to the Death Eater family that that we know of. Yep. So we had we basically created this character um, whole cloth for the role play because it, I mean he's barely in the books. We just know we know he existed. We right? know that he is the weaker younger brother to Bellatrix's husband. Like that's yeah. how he's described. Is the and that's it. That's all we know. That's it. Uh, so yeah. So we so never we never get to learn. We never really get to learn about him. I decided this was my baby and this is how he would do things. And of course, like any other younger sibling who just wants to be their older sibling, he also is in love with his brother's wife. Yeah. So we had this whole thing. We had this whole thing where, of course, like it was too, it was too late for him to marry Bella because Rodolphus had married Bella, but he had this like other crush um yeah. on uh, Abigail Knott, which was a, a Candace Acola FC that I played. And um, so he pursued her and uh, and we and we made so, OK, this is something that doesn't happen in the books, but I really like it. And I wish that a family like this existed in the books. Like, I just feel like if these guys are blood supremacists, right, one of the things that they would want to do is have lots and lots and lots of pure blood babies. So where's the family with like eight siblings? Why, why isn't there one? Like, I feel like there should be. So we created the Knots because that was a surname that was that we knew that had a Death Eater representation, and that's typically how we did things in this role play. I believe it was Abraham Knot. That's right. Okay. Yep. So we had um, Abraham Knot, who was um, the eldest of the family, and we gave him um, a gajillion siblings. Abigail Knot, of which was the youngest. I think there was five kids altogether. Don't ask me all their names. It's been a long time. I don't remember. Um, <laughs> But the oldest was the oldest was Abraham, and then there was like three or four in between, and then the youngest was Abigail. And that was uh, yeah, they all started with A because it's Harry Potter, and we got to be Alla cheesy. Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, either, you either have a theme or you start with the same letter. Right. So um, we created this family of the knots where they just kept having babies and babies and babies. And um, and that's where Abigail was born, because the and the other desire that I had with uh, creating Abigail as an OC is I just thought like 
why do we only have Bellatrix? We have Bellatrix and we have this cliff note character of Electo Caro and that's it. There's no other women in the Death Eaters period. And for both of those characters, um, there's like male related reasons that they're in the Death Eaters. Like um, Bellatrix is there because she loves Voldemort and that's how she got super into the cause. Um, Electo's twin is there and you know, Twins are, are a big thing in Harry Potter. There's several, yeah, there's several, uh, there's several twin pairs in Harry Potter. And, um, and I, I think that it's natural to assume that, like, she followed her twin, you know, to not be by herself. So I was like, I don't want to do that. I want a character that joins not for a man. So it was great. Now, don't tell her Bastion she didn't join for him, but she didn't. She joined of her own accord because she actually thought that these were good political ideas. Okay, I wanted to be extra super problematic. So that's what we created with um, Abigail and Rebastian. And they had a whirlwind love affair bonding over things such as torturing muggles yep. bad cooking and yes. gardening those were their favorite hobbies um, those three things and often patching each other's mistakes up because mm. there was a lot of those two of hey honey i accidentally locked someone in the basement we need to figure this out or hey honey i killed somebody let's hide this body <laughs> They were both very messy and not that great at being Death Eaters, to be quite honest. And so they were constantly having to go clean up after each other. Like, okay, have you guys seen You? Have you guys seen the show You? You, that's why we love them. Okay, so the second and third season of You, where he's with like the crazy girl that's also crazy, yeah, with love. Okay, that was them. Like, okay, that, we wrote this before You, but that was, like, that was them. Someone wa- read our RPs and was just like, actually, this would be uh, awesome. This would be awesome. <laughs> uh, this, would be, this would make sense. Um, yeah, I don't think that's the case, if, but. <laughs> we'll do it. It's the same thing. Let me believe Daniel, Daniel Radcliffe will watch this. Let me believe the person who watched you based it off of our writing. Thank you so much. I mean, there um, is one There is one time that I, I do feel like the writers read my stuff because I had a very prolific and active Haley Marshall blog. On, on Tumblr and then things would happen in canon that I had had canoned like months and months and months beforehand. I really do believe some of, cause they, and CW has like a writer's churn like crazy. I really do believe some of those writers trolled the Haley Marshall tag on Tumblr and took some of my stuff. I really do believe that. Like, sorry, it's but, like, I'm not joking. Like I feel like that happened. <laughs> um, but no, I think, and this is the, this is the fun of the fandom, uh, the opportunity with fandom is A, being able to be able to, to dig into these characters that obviously didn't get spotlight. Like, don't get me wrong. I understand why a book that is literally named Harry Potter is not digging deep into the personalities of a wizard who was arrested 12 years prior. Like, right. I get it. I understand it. It's not that I'm asking for it more. Um, but this is the fun part of fandom and why I love fandom so much. And this fandom in particular, because so this doesn't happen in a lot of fandoms where they take the side, where people take the side character and build headcanons that are then accepted like throughout the entire fandom or mostly Mm -hmm. throughout the entire fandom. Like this idea of, of, one of my favorite examples is like Sirius Black wearing a leather jacket. It is never once mentioned in any of the books that Sirius Black owns a leather jacket. However, but in I fandom, he I does. Sirius Black, he'd be in a fucking leather jacket. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it, it, and this is why, like, the Death Theater part of it is so interesting because we get to be adults or teenagers um, who are actually writing these characters with teeth that mm-hmm. we were denied in the Harry Potter series, yeah. um, whether that be because of editing or JKR herself or, or for whatever reason. We don't know. There's a lot of factors, obviously. Yeah, I mean, and, and I get it. Like, Voldemort is supposed to be aloof and powerful with his magic, which means that you're not going to see torture scenes with Voldemort because he doesn't believe in that. It's, it, he kills off handedly. So you ha- you can't have him be the scariest thing and then also have someone be torturing someone else. Like you yeah. can't, you can't do that on a, on a written basic plot arc level. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Voldemort it's, would need a lot more development to be able to do that. You know, he'd, be, he'd need to be a very different character in order. Yeah. To do um, yeah. like he, like the purpose of him is to be unattached yeah. and unhuman in that regard. Whereas, like, you could argue that the base of torture and trying to get information out of someone is like a very human thing. You need to understand how humans work uh, mm-hmm. in order to torture them, and he doesn't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's like this interesting. It's just a thing. Uh, yeah, and I, yeah, I think that it, that's what's so beautiful about this fandom is that you're able to explore all of those things, and then also, uh, it's it's universally accepted in some aspects. Yeah, I feel like other fandoms, it's hard for a fandom to get big enough and stay big for long enough to develop um, fandom accepted headcanons for characters that get like a single sentence in canon. Like most fandoms just don't last long enough or get big enough to do that. But Harry Potter did and does and has things like that and so when i when i look at like the death eaters because so many of them are just barely described in the books i just see like all of this opportunity i see this gold mine and i see you know this um this ability to take the death eaters that that are very underdeveloped and give them the teeth that the really developed death eaters don't have that voldemort doesn't have and basically fix it fic so i i can see like um I can create something that's like, oh, well, you know, Rodolphus was married to Bellatrix, so, you know, he must have been quite, uh, you know, quite prolific and terrifying as well. And, um, you know, I can say like, oh, well, he maybe he was the the main guy that went and uh, and, you know, captured uh, the people that were going to get taken to the torture for Bellatrix. So maybe he becomes a character that's kind of like this, um, this like front man, this kind of henchman of... Um, of Bellatrix and uh, and Rebastian's torture that they do on these muggles. So maybe he's the one that like got Frank and Alice to the spot, um, or or that uh, that secured the that basically secured the location. Right. Welcome back, Kay. Um, and I can do all of that, and it doesn't really contradict canon. It can just kind of like you know slide right in. And if other people are into it, they can they can very easily um, accept it. And, uh, and then you get to the point, because the fandom has lasted for so long, that I start to forget which things are canon and which things are not canon. <laughs> it's the worst. Uh... <laughs> Death Eaters are bad. Kay, you know, they're bad, but we love them. Especially if you ship a non-canon ship. Yeah. Um, like I do. I'll keep you guys guessing. Uh <laughs> We know who it is. It's Drary. Uh, and you're like, wow, did these things actually happen in the books? Or is this just a widely accepted truth amongst everybody who ships this, that things like this happen in the books? And then you go back and you reread the books and it turns out, hey, some of these things actually did happen. Yeah, but you can't uh, remember because you've read so much <laughs> fic about it. <laughs> it's, it's, and it's like, it's, it's part of what makes this fandom so special. Yeah. And unique and indescribable. Um. Death Eaters do equal bad for a lot of reasons. Uh, however, I got to tell you, Dobby's death, not top of that list. Yeah, let's move um, to that. Let's move to that. So we, we've we we've kind of like mentioned this here and there overall, but let's get to the real thesis statement. Why the Death Eaters aren't scary. So, so we, it can take them because so many of them really aren't developed very much and we can give them teeth and write these fix it fix, right? And we feel the urge to do that because they aren't really scary. After the fourth book, they're just not. Like this, like like Landon said at the beginning, the scarier scenes are with characters like Dolores Umbridge, not the Death Eater characters. They're not scary. So, you know, with that being said, um, like why? Why did why do you think that is, Landon? I think because so much of the world is Harry's perspective of things. Mm-hmm. Um and we don't the only times we get the opportunity of seeing the world outside of hogwarts where these terrible things aren't happening hypothetically um are are aren't are moments where the world is being explained to us Mm -hmm. and how are they who are they like it's this like big plot drop of you know the five 
five prisoners escape from Azkaban in the Order of the Phoenix and what are the terrible things that they did in order to make the entire world scared of them because Harry wasn't alive during that time or he was he was alive during that time but he was old enough to remember and the readers mm-hmm. have no connection to these characters so it's like okay here's a plot drop as to who they are and why we should be scared of them and they do horrific terrible things they never do in the books or at least because we don't see them for a long period of time um and the scariest and harry never fights the death eaters i mean he does in the fifth one but not really um it's other people fighting yeah, he's kind of like there during the fight right there yeah he's there witnessing the fight uh and it's an awesome moment of like character development to realize how inexperienced harry really is and he learns that in that moment of oh my gosh i've fallen right into their trap I am over my head in these duels. I can't really fight back because if I remember correctly, they're not really fighting them. The Order of the Phoenix comes and rescues them. Yeah, I think that's what happens. Uh, in movie, again, movie book is different. Um, Order of the Phoenix comes and rescues them. And, and so they don't really ever fight the Death Eaters. In the sixth book, when the Death Eaters take in over Hogwarts and, and infiltrate Hogwarts, Harry never really fights them. He has mm-hmm. one showdown with Severus Snape um when he realizes who Snape is like so the war for Harry is never against the Death Eaters so they're always background except for when they're and they're always background even in that fourth book yeah um but that fourth book is just such a high like intense moment it may, and it makes you believe that they're going to be this gigantic threat in the next couple of books. Like the the way that it ends with Harry being captured by them and them all standing around and the conversation they have with, with Voldemort that Harry witnesses, like you leave that scene believing like, oh shit, the Death Eaters are coming for Harry. Yeah. Like, and he's going to have to dodge them in the next book. He's going to have to fight them. Like that's what you leave that book believing. And then that doesn't happen. <laughs> It doesn't. Um, and, and in itself, that I actually enjoy. I enjoy the way that the story goes. I like that the government turns against Harry. It seems very mm. real. It brings mm-hmm. again back to who is Harry and who can he trust and who can't he trust. And the yeah. wizarding world in general is someone he can't trust. It In the fifth and seventh book, it becomes like the press and the hunting him down become a character itself um which makes it a very interesting different take but that means that never is the antagonist the true antagonists of any given moment death eaters until the seventh book and even then the people hunting him are not like the scariest moments in the seventh book are when the sneaker when the snatchers come none of them are death eaters all of them are working for Voldemort but none of them are death eaters Mm -hmm. um you know the the time in the mansion is not supposed to be Harry's Harry's not supposed to be scared during that time um yes we have Hermione's torture but this is this is a moment of escape and we know it because we know what's coming like we know that this is going to go home we know that this is going to go back to Hogwarts so the stakes aren't actually that high in those so um actually Kai it's very important to recognize that Dolores is not a death eater she's evil in her own right um, and that she is power hungry in her own way. Um, she she did believe she did turn with the tide of the ministry, but it's important to to note that she is not a Death Eater um, because she represents something else that I think is far worse. A U A U Death Eater Dolores Umbridge. <laughs> oh, I hear I hear a baby meowing. Um, yeah. So the Death Eaters aren't that scary. Come on, then. You want to come in? Yeah. No, Death Eaters are not that scary. She did her best, but you know, that's scary. <laughs> yeah, and I and I think that there's something to be said for the fact that like the target audience is younger and here we go, here's a baby. Here I'll turn on the baby cam too. Um I think there's something to be said that like the target audience is younger and so you know there's um there is like a an urge to defang them in that regard, but I also feel like one thing that that I that I lament that I feel like Harry Potter does and that um this kind of continues to happen is that um I think a lot of content creators think that kids can't handle things that they can totally handle. It's actually 
oh man, to not go completely off topic, but it's amazing to see how much children and young adult literature directed towards like middle grades has adapted over time. Um, And I'm like, because of this understanding now more what kids can actually handle and what they can engage in versus like, especially back when the books were published, but other like more classic books were published to recognize that like character, like children who are 12 years old can handle stuff. Yeah. And I feel like gory, but they can understand it. And I feel like that um, things are things that are changing in that regard are going back to how they used to be um, before Harry Potter, because as you know, I found that the first 10 Animorphs books are available on Spotify for free. So I've been re-listening to them. I've been re-listening to the first ones and like, Man, some of the things that happen in those books are really scary and intense and complicated. And those are middle grade books. And if I think about it, you know, like not all the Goosebumps books were like this, but a lot of them were actually scary. And then I feel like Harry Potter came along and it took everyone by storm and people copied so much from Harry Potter. And maybe they didn't realize that they were copying the fact that, you know, there's not a huge amount of stakes in these books compared to what came before. And um, I feel like we're just now kind of getting back to the way things maybe used to be in the 90s, uh, well, where we knew kids could take it. It was okay. And it's, not even, it's not even scary. It's also heavy topics. Yeah. Like, like I'm reading, I read this book with my class. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm a sixth grade teacher. Uh, I read this book with my class and like alcoholism and drug addiction is, it's, it's for fourth graders and I'm reading to a sixth grade class, but it's mentioned and talked about in a serious problem existing within the book. Um, obviously it has nuanced and it's affecting the protagonist in a very different way than like an adult fiction would, mm-hmm. but it's like kids can handle these complex emotions and themes. And I do feel that Harry Potter and then the YA trend to follow it did kind of neutralize anything that was not exciting in a good way yeah um it did change the state what stakes were appropriate for children by setting them back Mm -hmm. Um, and that could be either I mean and that could be serious topics like I was talking about or that could be like like intense moments yeah yeah no I think so too I think so too, 100%. So yeah, the Death Eaters aren't that scary. You guys are going to see um, as we kind of go through the next books during this year, during 2022, that, um, you know, I had a lot of complaints about the first two books, and then I had a lot of praise about the third and fourth book. I'm going to start getting more complainy again, and this we, is a large part of it. I we, expected more after the first fourth book, and I didn't get it. That's fair. We have not hit my favorite book yet. So I yeah. will, my despondence of the series uh, won't really, it will start to, to wear off, but I'm, I am a sucker for four, five, and six. Um, and, and I think they do a really good job in some of the way, in some things and they, and, and she does not do great in others. Um, yeah. I think it's a pure difference seven, of, of our, I think it's a pure difference of our age. Like, honestly, yeah. like I, I was a little bit older. And so I had the, I had the wherewithal to have those higher expectations where I think if I had started Harry Potter later and been a younger Harry Potter fan, like you were, I don't think I would have, I don't well, think I would have I mean, cared, you know, I would have just been still, still right along for it. <laughs> The last book came out in seventh grade for me, either seventh or eighth grade. Yeah. Um, yeah, 2007, so seventh grade. Uh, and that would have made me um, 13, 14. Yeah, and I was a so, senior in high school, like, um, you know. Yeah, so very, very different reading. No, 2007, no, 2007, I would have been, no, I was a senior in college. Senior in college. Okay, that makes yeah, more sense. I was a senior in um, college. Yeah. So, so I, like, I mean, I had technically outgrown Harry Potter. Yeah. I, and that changes, that changes ex- like how we look at these books he, mm-hmm. like a lot. What, I cannot remember. When was your last reread? Um, oh gosh, it's been a minute. Um, okay. It was probably, it was probably sometime after we closed, a uh, little bit after we closed um, Love Our Only Hope. Because I think I reread them about a year or two years or so after we closed that, that role play. Seven years ago. Yeah, it was a long time. So it was a while ago. So it, yeah. it might, I mean, and not saying that things are going to hugely change, but I mean, you've been surprised with what you've reread in the series. And how yeah. So far. Yeah. Um, 
So it'll be interesting to see if anything changes with this later half. Um, For sure. But I agree with you. I wish... I wish these Death Eaters had more teeth and I'm happy yep. that the fandom agrees. So that and I that's why I, and that's why I do <laughs> so much of my, um, my Harry Potter role play and fanfic stuff is set in Marauders because I feel like I just have more room. I have more room for teeth. I also feel like there is a very different setting in the war- first war and the second war in the second war. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first war had a lot more build up. Mm -hmm. and um and had a lot and lasted a lot longer in some ways than others um and also we know the ramifications of the afterwards um whereas with with harry we don't i mean things end when voldemort dies and all of the people who were at that in that battle get arrested hypothetically um and maybe there's after but i mean there was and then still- we skip to years oh, later we have no idea what happened yeah. in between there were still muggle attacks and people yeah. still that Voldemort were alive was alive for years after he died the first time and and all of those kinds of things which which really impacted like what these characters were able to do and why they were so scary yeah um so yeah all right do we have a um a good news article for today that we can pull up Uh-oh. landon good news article you know Kay, i've never read the christopher pike books um i haven't either yeah i don't what series does he do he does not sound super familiar to me love them okay well i might have to take a look i might have to take a look okay let's open this up Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to go to the ending screen for a second there. I clicked the wrong one. Okay. Artist makes incredible dollhouses of miniature film sets from Harry Potter, Friends, and Jurassic Park. Oh, my God. I love it. I thought <gasps> it this. was really good. Oh, my God. It's so tiny. You can see their finger right there. It's little, little bitty. It's tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, oh I God. love whatever. <sighs> I love whatever this, like, little... Uh trend that is happening in the world right now where everyone's like in love with miniature things um yeah like the like tiny kitchen like tiny kitchen tiny food um my my sixth graders have started bringing things for their desks to like literally build like little tiny kitchen table and stuff like that what landon that's too cute (laughs) it's so cute and i love it and then i love this that there's like an artist who is making like tiny shit Oh my gosh. <gasps> Look at this. Oh my gosh. <gasps> These are amazing. Okay. Is there, do they have a link to this person's like Instagram or something? I'm trying to see. I don't see one. I don't see one. But oh my God. Like just look at this. Look at the little Barbie doll. Oh my God. I just yeah, like, cute. and it's so tiny. So tiny. Look at that tiny Hulk and the tiny comics. Oh my gosh. That's a secret. I'm always angry. <laughs> Bridget, who was also trained in animation art, said other things artists brought a lot of my pieces to motivate me to keep up. Oh, they because they bought them. Oh, yeah. And here's like a tiny kitchen set. Tiny craft dinner. Oh, I want some craft dinner. Yeah, they're so detailed. Like, look at these Bath and Body yeah. Works. No, they're it's insane how like tiny things can get mm-hmm oh my gosh i love that he does the last vampire series thirst which is his most beloved because it's gone on for so long but he also does a lot of YA horror and slowly moving towards more adultish themes i think active in the early 90s early 2000s and then a list of a bunch of other work okay yeah i feel like um 90s and early 2000s like right before harry potter got super super popular a lot of ya lit was just overall darker and heavier and you yeah. know more willing to engage with intense themes and then in the post harry potter world it was little like i feel like um the themes were still there but like uh all of the tough parts were like filed away you know that's how i feel like a lot a lot of what happened yeah yeah um this is so cute, though. Oh, my gosh. Okay, let, I, I just got a Bridget McCarty. Let's gotta see. follow her on Instagram, people. Here we go. Oh, my gosh. Ooh, Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so Lunar much for the... Um... Daydream gifted a tier Thank one you. sub to Jed Lem. Thank you so much for the tier one sub gift, Lunar Jed. Please enjoy your tier one sub. Okay, I found the Instagram. Here we go. Instagram. Oh, my gosh. oh here's the friend set. Look at that. 
pizza. This is so cool. <gasps> they making they making craft dinner. Oh, yum yum yum. Craft dinner. Oh, they strain the craft dinner. Oh my god. Sorry guys, I'm just like so enamored. <gasps> It's Tiny Craft Dinner. Tiny Craft Dinner. Oh my gosh. What is this? Oh, this is Jurassic Park. Ha ha ha. <laughs> oh, this is so good. Okay. <gasps> Wait. Tiny macaroons. Oh, it's tea time. We're going to have tiny tea time, guys. Tiny tea time. That. <gasps> oh my gosh. And tiny tea. Tiny tea for the tiny tea time. Tiny tea for the tiny tea time. <laughs> Excuse me, say a sentence. The ones where they really cook is insane to me. Me too, Kitty. Me too. Oh my god, I want to eat those all. I, I'm pretty sure they're they're not edible. These ones are not I, edible, but I just no, want to eat them. I appreciate how much art and time and effort goes into this. I would go fucking crazy if I spent more time trying to make a mini version of like ramen than I did making an actual version of ramen. <laughs> Mickey cookies. Okay, I love this. All right. All right, guys. Okay, okay. We're done with this. I could spend, I'm going to spend too long looking at this. Okay, guys. So, I'm glad I ruined your day. <laughs> yeah, no, this is wonderful. Okay, guys. So, um, so that's it. That's, that's our episode today. Uh, Landon, where can everybody find you? You can find me at Land in Maine on Twitter. Right now, I am on a 19 day streak for Wordle. Uh, so, you can see my daily updates. <laughs> <laughs> um shard did not get me like it did the rest of the world um and you can also follow me on instagram at the same name land in maine it's a pun <laughs> yes also um landon landon needs some some things she wants to improve yes. her set so please check out her wish list i do um, i need a tripod because see you see how i don't th you don't see my ears it's because throughout the entire stream my camera has been slowly falling forward yeah uh, watch it watch it on two times speed I and just watch also, it go doo, 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 doo. it's also been shifting to the left today so i'm slowly like on the corner of my desk over here like yeah yep so <laughs> We need so to get Landon a tripod. If you a tripod or a light, I would appreciate and love you very much. Yep. Um, yeah. Yep. Um, also, quick thing that I want to let you guys know. Um, we were going to be doing Hamilton next week, but it's actually going to be the week after that. I apologize. Stuff has come up where I have to um, go out of town and I will be on a plane on Saturday. So I will not be able to stream. I don't think the Wi-Fi from the plane will be good enough. <laughs> so... <laughs> So we're gonna skip. We're gonna skip a week of streaming. Um, probably not gonna stream on Thursday, but I might move the Thursday stream to Wednesday, depending on what um, what me and my husband are doing on Wednesday. They got a new video game, so if they're still playing the video game on Wednesday, I might stream. But we'll see. I will keep you guys updated in the Discord and on Twitter um, about that possibility. But you you guys might not see me for another week. It might not be until the next Thursday when we come back to Pokemon. So I will let you guys know. I'll keep you updated um, with all of that situation. Uh, basically, I mean, y'all know, cause I've talked about this. I'm going to the service for my grandparents. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's why I'm going to be on a plane. So I'm going to be busy. I'm going to be busy. All right. And here's where you can find me. I do the same things, the same ways as all other content creators do. I post my VODs to YouTube. I have a Discord server. If you're interested in supporting me, um, I have like a wish list and all of the ways to support me, of course, down in my about. Thank you so much for the applause, Kitty. I appreciate all the applause today. As you guys know, now Landon can live another week. And um, we've gotten multiple applauses today, which is really great. That way she can last the two weeks since we're not streaming next Saturday. Um, so you're good. She's got enough fuel to last <laughs> i also need to tell you that this hamilton episode that we're going to do in two weeks is going to be full of hot takes super spicy and by spicy i mean interesting not you know only fan spicy uh and you i might... mean we can make we can make it like that we can, yeah. i mean we we got kind of like that a little bit in this stream so you know stay you tuned also might see Karen and I argue a little bit, which could be a lot of fun. Uh, if if you like to watch adults argue with each other kindly, respectfully, and knowing that we love each other in the end. So um, here's the preview. Here's the preview for that episode. I'm a Hamilton hater. Landon, on contrast, is a Hamilton lover. 
so they you got the Hamilton tattoo plan. Hamilton yeah. lover so much. You got the Hamilton lover. You got the yeah. Hamilton hater. If you are like a diehard Hamilton lover like Landon is, um, come listen to me rip apart your favorite musical. Um, if you are a, a Hamilton hater like I am, then come listen to me and clap along with my correct takes. <laughs> And enjoy a piece of art and see that there is there is beauty behind every you know what we're saving this for two weeks from now yeah it's happening in two weeks can't wait for karen to tear my heart apart can't wait to tear your heart apart kitty i'm looking so forward to it <laughs> hates that she likes it <laughs> oh my god oh my god anyway in two weeks you can get my comment to to that little dig right there I'm, but i'm saving it i'm saving it Okay, we're um we're rating Saskatchewan, which I never can spell his name right because he's got all those O's. So I'm just gonna copy paste. There we go. Um, he's playing a playing Apex Legends. So um, you know, we want some we want some Death Eaters with teeth. We want them to to do the bad thing. So let's go watch Saskatchewan shoot some peeps in video games, not in real life. Okay, we don't want to do that in real life, only in fiction. <laughs> very important. <laughs> yes. All right, guys. Of course, as always, don't forget to make it a great day. Don't forget to be awesome. All right. Bye, y'all. See you Bye. later.